Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Last week we had some good conversation about the condition of our heart. Scripture says that the way our hearts go will determine our entire lives. And so it makes a lot of sense that we would take the time to attend to the matters of the heart. I know you got a lot to do today. I know you got a lot to do in life. But taking the time to think about the condition of your heart is really important. And it might scare you and you might not know how to, but just taking the time even this morning to slow down, to breathe, to pray, to listen to the scripture is going to help us get closer to God. Because as we get closer to God, that's how we really know what's going on in our hearts. We don't really know. We can't do this on our own. We are so pathetic. Tell your neighbor, I'm pretty pathetic. I always love when the comedians among us say, Victor's pretty pathetic. Victor's pretty pathetic. And so it's a good question. Sundays are really good. Sundays are really good. And the reason why Sundays are really good is because we come and we go, how's it going? We left last week inspired and maybe convicted and challenged and maybe with some goals and some plans. And then we come back again on Sunday and say, how did it go? How did the attending to our hearts go this last week? We talked last week about if we're going to pray, we need to make a plan to pray. How did that go this week? And then maybe some of us go, oh, yeah, I meant to do that. Well, it's good that we're here again today, not specifically in this church, but just coming where the people of God are and where the Bible is going to be read because it helps us attend to our hearts. The two most limited resources in your life are your time and your money. And here's some thoughts about how we take care of our money These are some statistics that were troubling. Only around a quarter of Americans have some kind of written financial plan, right? So only about 25% of us have a budget, right? The rest of us, it's in our head, right? Because we're just wicked smart. We know how much money we got. We know how much we spent on Dunkin'. And if someone said, I don't know if you're spending your money just right, you'd say, no, sir. No, sir. I know. Well, not true. Only 20, about 25% of us have a budget, have a plan. Just 39 of, 39% of Americans have enough cash to cover a $1,000 emergency. Car breaks down, where's it go? On the card. Goes on the credit card. Even you go to the mechanic, they go, you know, we have a card that you could get to pay for this right now. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. 39% of Americans have enough cash to cover if a $1,000 emergency came. of Americans saved nothing for retirement in 2020. 32% of Americans, one-third of Americans saved nothing, right? And so someone was like, hey, I saved five bucks. That's great. For 32%, nothing in 2020. And you might be thinking, well, 2020 was a different kind of year. Was it a different kind of year for you? Yes, it was. Well, here's some more stats. Almost half of Americans have missed one or more rent or mortgage payments since the COVID-19 outbreak. Half of Americans, that that means that maybe even half of the people in this room had some trouble paying the rent, had some trouble paying the mortgage. And and here's the reason why. Now, there are a lot of reasons why. Rents are crazy high. The job that you work at might not be paying you enough, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality of it is, because we don't plan and because we don't take intentional action with the limited resource of our money, when trouble comes, we don't know what to do. Now, that's normal for all of us. We're like, who has seven mortgage payments just stuck under the mattress, right? And if so, please see me after. <laughs> right? We, we, don't, we don't plan, and if we do, maybe we don't plan as well as we'd like to. But the reality of it is, is money is limited. Say amen. Money is limited. And so if you are not intentional with how you take care of your financial resources, there's a good chance that it won't be used the right way. Right When I make a budget and stick to it, the first thing on the line goes, how much is coming in? The second thing on the line is tithing, because don't you know that can go somewhere if you don't make a plan for it? Pastor, yes, amen, it it can. And then the next thing are the fixed expenses, your mortgage, your rent, your utility bills, your student loan, perhaps. And then after that, you see, okay, how much do I have left for groceries, for going out, for Paying for this, for paying for that, for Duncan. 
And when you make a plan like that, it doesn't create more money, but it gives you purpose and intentionality. So you make sure that you're spending the things on the top of the paper first. And if there's left over, then you get the coffee. Then you get the vacation. Then you get the new pair of shoes or whatever it is that you want to get. Because if you're not intentional with that which is limited, chances are you will spend it the wrong way, right? I can show you some outfits that were spent the wrong way from my closet, not yours. I'm not saying someone right now is wearing something they shouldn't. I'm not saying that. And then what happens when the unexpected happens, when calamity strikes, because we haven't had a plan and been intentional, we don't know what to do. And then we miss the mortgage payment and we miss the rent payment and we miss the car payment because sometimes life doesn't go the way we expect it to. Anybody, has that ever happened to anybody? Yeah. Well, the same is true with our time. Our time is limited as well. And unless you and I make a plan about how we're going to spend our time, we will find ourselves using our time for things other than the most important things. Amen? You wake up and everybody's got 24 hours in the day. But then somehow at the end of the night, you're like, man, how did that happen? And so the same thing with our time. First thing we do is how much do we have? Second thing on that list, how much is going to go to God? And then work, and then family, and then hobbies, and then whatever else. Because when calamity strikes, if we haven't managed our time well, we find ourselves deficient and then in debt. There needs to be intentionality or else the resources will be wasted on things that aren't important. I have spent many of days swiping on Instagram and scrolling on Facebook and, you know, watching YouTube videos, but did not pray. And did not read scripture. How did that happen? How did that happen? I I hope I'm the only one. Has that ever happened to anybody else where it's like, wow, it might not be Facebook for you. It might be reading in a very fancy book or something or whatever. (laughs) And you find yourself at the end of the day going, what happened? Well, we weren't intentional. We didn't have our plan. And that brings us back to the verse that we need to watch over our heart with all diligence. When you're watching over your finances, you're making a budget. When you're watching over your time, you have a schedule and a plan and deadlines and things on your calendar so that you can have more success being the person that you want to be when you wake up in the morning. Because we all know that we are at times pathetic. And distracted. So scripture is pleading with us again and again that we would watch over our heart with all diligence for from it flow the springs of life. And so today's question is, what are the things that we need to watch for? What are the things that we need to be on guard against or watchful of so that our hearts can be where they want, where we want them and God wants them to be at the end of our day? What do we watch for? Let's go to Luke chapter 8. Jesus provides four answers for us today. Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 4. When a large crowd was coming together, and those from various cities were journeying with him, He spoke by way of a parable. If you're new to the Bible, a parable is basically a story that would have been understood by most people, but it's going to have a deeper spiritual meaning. That's what it is. Verse 5. The sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell beside the road and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky soil, and as soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew with it and choked it out. Other seed fell on the good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And he said these, as he said these things, he would call out, he who has an ear, let him do what? Hear. Hear. His disciples began questioning him as to what this parable meant. And he said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. And so one of the reasons Jesus spoke in parables is because he was trying to get inside information to his disciples 
to help prove to them that they were his disciples. He would speak, and those that were following him and walking with him, they would come to him and say, Lord, what does this mean? Is this just some silly story? It kind of is a silly story. I mean, what a, what a lame farmer. He's planting, and he's just like, what does it mean? Well, his disciples are going to ask him, and Jesus is saying here, that for those who are following him, who, who want to know the condition of their heart, who want to watch their heart, who want to be the people that God is calling them to be, they're going to dig a little bit deeper. And he wants that kind of relationship with us. He wants a kind of relationship with us where we don't, we're not satisfied with just the surface, but we want to dig a little bit deeper. Jesus, what are you saying to us this morning? And so he will explain it. Verse 10. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, the gospel. Those beside the road are those who have heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they will not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no firm root, and they believe for a while, but in time of temptation they fall away. The seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and as they go their way, they're choked with worries and riches and pleasures in this life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the seed and the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. So we're going to look at these four soils this morning to help us answer the question, what should we be watching for? What do we need to be on guard against? What do we need to be mindful of? Because he's talking ultimately here about the condition of our heart and things that will try to stop God's word and his work in our lives from being fruitful. Again, as you've been following with us the last few weeks, the end goal of our life and connection to Christ is that we would bear fruit. That our lives would be changed and we would begin to see more of him and less of who? Us. And so again, this parable, this story is ending with, you will bear much fruit. So it's another thing that we should pay attention to because Jesus, your master, your teacher is going to help you see the things you need to be on guard against. Now, I know many of you have heard this parable before. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the parable of the sower. Raise your hand if you could, maybe off the top of your head, recite the four different grounds. Okay, a couple of us, yes, all right, Bible trivia buffs, yeah, I like, those are my people. Here's the thing, the temptation for those of us that have heard this before, or maybe even heard a sermon on it, or preached a sermon on it, is that we aren't on guard against these things. Because this parable isn't just a story about how people hear the gospel for the first time, it's also a lesson to his disciples on what they need to be on guard against and watch about because out of their heart are going to come all the issues of life. And so the first thing that he tells us here in verse 12 is that those beside the road are those who have heard and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. So the first thing that we need to watch over our hearts against is the devil. The very first thing, before this seed can even get into the soil, it says that the devil comes and snatches it away so that the person will not receive that gospel and be saved. And so the first thing that we need to be on guard against, anybody want to be a disciple of Jesus? Raise your hand if you want to be a disciple of Jesus. Okay, sorry to put that pressure on you. Just feel like you have to raise it. I, it's just, sorry. I'll, I'll try to stop. I'll try to stop. Raise your hand if you want me to stop doing that. Okay. <laughs> you need to be on guard against the devil. The devil is out to get you away from God, distracted, defeated, full of shame, deceived so that you can have a relationship with God, so that you get discouraged in your following of Jesus. The devil likes to bring uh, discouragement. He likes to bring deception. Scripture says that he's like a thief that wants to steal and kill and destroy. John, John chapter 8 says that the devil is a liar. Whenever he speaks, his native language is lies. 
And so he loves to lie to people. He loves to try to tempt and distract God's people from what they know is true and what they know they ought to be doing. The devil loves to do that with you. You need to be on guard against that. The devil, one of the ways that he comes isn't just in this like, ah, scary sort of thing, although there's plenty of that in the spiritual realm, but the devil likes to bring confusion. He is an author of confusion. He brings confusion into your life where you get all mixed up and you're not really sure what you're supposed to do. You get confused. You're not really sure what's true anymore. You're really not sure uh, who God is anymore. You get confused. He likes to lie. He likes to cause trouble. He likes to bring demonic opposition. So we need to watch out for that. Jesus tells us ahead of time to watch out because your adversary, the devil, is like a lion roaring, prowling around to get you to disconnect from God. Maybe not kill you, right? Maybe not, maybe not you know, totally ruin your life and turn things upside down. But every day that he can rob you from your time with God is a good day for him. Every time you push through your brain not working right and getting distracted and thinking about all of the things when you sit down in that chair to spend five minutes with your God or on the commute to work, you're so focused, you want to listen to the Bible, you want to pray for your family for just those few minutes. Every time you push through what the devil is trying to get you to stop doing is a victory. Every time. It might be small and seemingly insignificant, but if you push through, you, sh you showed up here today and it might have been all sorts of opposition. That's victory. Your heart is going to be more guarded because you did that today. So the first thing he says is we need to watch out for the devil. The second thing is in verse 13, those on rocky soil are those when they hear, receive the word with joy, and they have no firm root and they believe for a while and in time of what fall away? Time of temptation. Here's how Matthew's gospel says it. Matthew chapter 13, verse 20 and 21 say, The seed on rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately they receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. So let's think about it here in the progression of this parable. You realize there's a devil. You realize the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to rob your relationship. He wants to discourage you, confuse you, cause shame and doubt. And he wants to separate you from God. And you say, no way, devil, get behind me, Satan. I'm pushing through. Great. But we're not done. Because the next thing that happens is you push through, you receive joy. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right today. I'm pushing through. I'm having victory. Well, the very next thing that Jesus says is that you got to be careful because the rocky soil might threaten you. And what's the rocky soil? The rocky soil of people who believe and have joy. The devil doesn't steal the seed away. They have joy. They receive it, but they don't have deep roots. And when trouble comes or persecution comes, they fall away. When the trouble comes, the joy goes away. Now, we know this is true about a new disciple and a new Christian, but is it true about our lives too? Of course it is. Things in life rob me of the joy that God has given me. My body hurting causes me to not have joy. Seeing what's going on in the news can be very discouraging. Dealing with other people other than myself can be frustrating at times. So he says to watch for affliction which are difficulty and trials, temptation, choices and enticements, and persecution, which is pressure or trouble. So when you see difficulty on the horizon in your life, that's something you need to watch for. When someone does something to you that offends you, and you have to deal with the trouble of someone saying something to you that you did not like, that's an opportunity right there where you're going to be tempted to get hard-hearted. Isn't that what Jesus is saying, the rocky soil? He's talking about hard-heartedness. When our hearts get hard, 
Our hearts are no longer in the place where God can work through them. We get guarded. We withdraw. We get discouraged. We are tempted to quit. And trouble in life and persecution and opposition can cause that. Amen? Being offended, being in difficult situation, having doubts, things not going the way that you thought can lead to discouragement and your heart getting hard. And so the remedy here, he says, or the, or the problem that he identifies here is that the rocky soil doesn't allow for the roots to grow down deep. Don't you know that roots are the most important part of the plant? I mean, we like the potted plant on our desk that looks really nice and it's beautiful and it's flowery. Maybe you don't. Maybe you like it in the garden. Maybe you like seeing it out when you're driving around, right? But the most important part of the plant is actually a part that can't be seen. And actually, the most important, important part of the plant is still growing and is still working, even when it looks like the outside of the plant, which you can see, is doing nothing. And that's so much of the Christian life. So much of the Christian life is growth that can't be seen on the outside, but is happening on the inside. Prayer, time in Scripture, fellowship doesn't always have an immediate response. We prayed for things today. Go, someone go online real quick and see if the war in Ukraine is over. But that doesn't mean that the prayers we pray didn't shift something or change something or move something or put someone in the right place at the right time. Maybe one person's life got affected because of the prayers of people in Rhode Island here this morning. So we don't always see that, but we can get discouraged to think that those things that are getting us to go down deep to have roots are not worth our time. And so when trouble comes, what goes out the window? Prayer. When difficulty comes, what goes out the window? Don't have time for scripture anymore. When you're offended, guess what? You're not going to spend time with other people because they might do it again. The person might be in this room. The person might be speaking from the pulpit this morning. So the question that Jesus asks you this morning is when trouble comes in your life, are you going to quit? When someone offends you, are you going to quit? When difficulty comes, are you going to quit? When things seem like they're going really well for a while and then all of a sudden it stops, are you going to stop? Now we all say no, but Jesus is saying you need to watch out for this because it's going to be very easy for trouble to come and your heart to get hard. And as soon as your heart gets hard, you're done. The next soil is the thorny soil in verse 14 of Luke 8. The seed which fell amongst the thorns are the ones who have heard, and as they go their way, they are choked with worries and riches and pleasures in this life and bring no fruit to maturity. Mark says it this way. Mark 4, 19 says about the thorny soil, the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. We've said this many times. What's the point of putting an apple seed in the ground? Is it to produce an apple tree? No, it's not. It's to produce apples. The goal of an apple seed in the ground is not for an apple tree. It's for apples. And so here, this thorny ground produces a plant, but it doesn't bring forth fruit to maturity because something stops the progress along the way and doesn't allow for the fruit to be produced. Here, Jesus tells us that the things that are going to choke the word from being unfruitful in your life or from being fruitful in your life are the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. Now, the function of thorns or, or weeds in a garden is that they steal the nutrients that are required for the plant to grow and produce fruit. That's what thorns do. Have you ever noticed that thorns and weeds grow crazy fast? Wicked fast. You <laughs> Looking at Dan Kutcher, who's the guy that pulls the weeds here at the church, and he's like, he's only 25 years old, but look at him. 
all these weeds. <laughs> the, the thorns and the weeds steal the nutrients that are in the soil that would support the plant from growing fruit. And unless those thorns and those weeds are pulled out and removed, it will begin to choke the very plant that started to grow and was going very well. You see, this person recognizes that there's a devil and says, I'm not falling for his tricks. Goes through trouble, goes through difficulty, goes through disappointment and says, I'm not giving in. Jesus said there'd be days like this. But then pleasure and busyness and hurry and commitment and the deceitfulness of riches and the lies of the adversary, not in persecution and trouble, but in pleasure, start to crowd out what God's work can do. And so suddenly this person thinks that one hour or maybe 35 minutes of scripture spoken by someone else on a Sunday is sufficient to give me the nutrients I need to produce fruit. You might grow by coming here, but you may not produce fruit. Because if the rest of the week your life is filled with stuff, busyness, commitments, unmanaged, unbudgeted time, you'll find yourself here week after week going, why isn't anything changing? A garden left untended, only one week of pulling, one day of pulling weeds, you're going to come back, you're going to find more. The function of thorns and weeds is to steal the resources and nutrients needed to bring fruit to maturity. And so the danger of thorny ground is that the kind of people that are thorny ground grow, but they never produce fruit. They stick around, they have longevity, they may even have faithfulness, but they never produce the spiritual fruit, which is the goal of the seed being planted. They don't produce fruit because they keep their lives. They keep in their lives the things which steal the resources needed to produce fruit. Their heart is never completely given to the Lord. And you know what this looks like? This looks like the marriage that celebrates 50 years, but the husband and wife don't ever talk. This is the father who works really hard at his job to provide for his family, but doesn't have a relationship with his children as a result. And so here, Jesus is warning us for the condition of our heart to be what it ought to be. Things need to be cut back in order to ensure that the seed will grow and grow to the point where fruit can come. The worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things. So Jesus tells us ahead of time to watch out for those things. This isn't the devil. This isn't persecution because you're a Christian. This is you. This is me. This is choices. This is the world that we're living in telling us what we should do with our time or us saying, no, 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 I got a budget. Budgets are so, they're just sexy. Budgets are sexy. <laughs> Put that on a bumper sticker or something. So Jesus tells us to watch out ahead of time. And so let's go to the last one, the place we want to arrive, the good soil. Verse 15, the seed on the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word with an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with what? Perseverance. And so as we follow the train of Jesus' thought here, we want to watch over our heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Your life is going to be determined by the quality of your heart. Not the circumstances of your life necessarily, but who you are on the inside, your relationship with God. And the first thing Jesus is saying is watch out for the devil. There's a spiritual battle. This morning, some of you need to remember that there's a devil and he's trying to mess with you and he's lying to you. He's causing confusion. He's holding you back in generational patterns of what your family has always done. There might be spiritual evil spirits that are out to get you and against you. You got to say, no, in Jesus' name, I am free from those things. Those, that's not who I am anymore. Back off. And then you need to watch out for the trouble that might come, the pressures that might be in your life, your tendency to be easily offended, your lack of willingness to realize that there are struggle in this life. And you push through beyond that, and then you get to the point where things are calling for your attention and for your time, and you say, no, I know I need to do this. I know I need to do that. But God is first in my life. 
My time with God, though it might be small, is powerful, and the devil and trouble and persecution or soccer practice is not stealing that. And you push through and you get rid of, you cut back the thorns and the weeds and you arrive at this place where you find yourself free from the rocks, free from the thorns. And we always have to be on guard against the crows, the thorns, and the, and the rocks. It's not like once you're good ground, you're always good ground. But when those things are cut back and observed, you find yourself in this place where you're, the, the soil of your heart is fertile and ready for, for God's word to come in and to change you and to produce fruit. And the kind of heart, it says, that produces the fruit is an honest and good one. An honest and good one. That's where we started a month and a half ago about being honest about what's really going on in our hearts. It's still the key to seeing God change us to be honest about who we really are. Because God can't change the person we're pretending to be. He can change the people who we really are. And when we come to him with that honest and good heart and say, Lord, help me, he does. So with that honest and good heart, we hold fast and we persevere. We stick it out through the devil's attacks. We stick it out through the hard things that we deal with. We stick it out through the thorny things in, in life and we hold fast and we stay faithful and we do it again 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 and we do it again. And I don't know if you know what's happening right now and I'm saying doing it again, but roots are growing down deep. You don't see them, but I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. And roots are holding. Now water is going down there and the, the, the rain that I thought was going to stop me is actually helping me to grow and it's going down deep and oh my goodness I did it again I did it again I did it again and now those roots have touched an underground stream and spring which I didn't even know was there but because I kept pushing something has happened in me something has changed in me and all of a sudden bink, there's a blossom there's a blossom and I'm not stopping because there's a blossom. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to stay close to Christ. I'm going to stay in fellowship. I'm going to keep giving and being generous. I'm going to keep forgiving and not letting my heart get hardened. And that blossom suddenly turns to fruit. And now I see love in my life that's not as forced, but it's from the Spirit. And joy, not short-lived joy, and peace that transcends what the devil's trying to do or the problems that I have or the persecution that's going on. And long-suffering, God is helping me to endure and persevere because I'm just going to stay faithful. And I'm going to let him do the work in me because after all, apart from him, we can do nothing. It's our attachment to the vine that causes this to happen. And over time, our lives begin to change. And we begin to see God work in glorious and amazing ways because we came to him with who we really were and we stayed there. I love how Jesus ends this story in Luke. He says this. Now, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a container or puts it under a bed. But he puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not become evident, nor anything secret that will not be known and come to life. And he's reminding us that in, in the last day, in the judgment, everything's going to be revealed. Our whole life and who we really were and what was really going on is, is all going to be revealed. And his invitation to us is the next verse. So in light of that, take care how you listen. Take care how you listen, which is another way of saying, watch over your heart with all diligence. Take care how you listen, for whoever has to him more shall be given, and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has, shall be taken away from him. Jesus ends this important parable just the way we started this morning by saying, take this seriously. Take the quality and the condition of your heart seriously. There is no other pursuit or endeavor that is worth the priority of your heart and your time. So wherever you find yourselves in this journey this morning, if you feel the devil is attacking you, if you feel that uh, trouble is abounding and it's like rocky places, if, if you feel the thorns of your life just choking his word out of you, or you find yourself with a tender heart this morning, his invitation to all of us is to come close and get quiet and say, Lord, here's my heart. Show me what needs to change. 
Show me what needs to go. Show me what's really going on. And then the great physician will begin to help us hear that heartbeat. And if you don't hear him speak the first time you ask, ask him again. If you don't hear him speak the next time, if you need to get up and take a breath and come back to the chair, say, God, I want to know the condition of my heart. And your father who loves you will show you and speak to you so you can be close to him, which is his greatest desire to be close to you. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would do just what we ask now, Lord, that you would speak to us, that we would hear your still small voice, that the Bible would speak loudly your truth to us. Lord, we give you our hearts today. I give you my heart today, God, and I ask that you would Help me to see what's really going on there. I pray that you would keep the devil away in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would help our hearts be free from rocks. And that when the rocks of trouble and persecution and trials come, we could stay faithful. I pray for those of us this morning whose lives are just choked right now. We've got so much going on. We don't have peace. We feel spread thin. Lord, please clip the thorns around our heart that we may breathe again. We give you our heart, God, that you would shape it to be honest and good before you, to produce fruit which will bring you glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.